Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The Secretary will close the roll. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is our former Senate chaplain, Reverend Phil Young of St. Michael, Minnesota, and following the Phil Shaw. I should call him Friend Sir Jasinski, I think. Uh, from St. Michael, Minnesota, and following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. You can call me anything you want to, sir. That's <laughs> just fine. Good morning, Senator. It's nice to see you again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on these senators who've been chosen to serve the people of Minnesota. You know their needs, their motives, their hopes, dreams, and fears. So put your arm around them and give them strength for the challenges they face. Give them wisdom far greater than their own. And may they hear your voice and seek your guidance. And Lord, remind them that you do care about what is said and done in their committee meetings and the decisions made in this chamber. And we're so thankful for the hard work these senators and the supportive staff of this Senate provide for the people of our state. And may God richly bless them and their families and loved ones. In your name we pray, amen. The secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson, Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingerbritson, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson, Stewart, Kent, Kiffmeyer, Klein, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Lopez, Franzen, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmick, Pappas, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rust, Rosen, Senjum, Thomasoni, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Thomasoni, Torres, Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. The Senators Anderson, Bingham, Carlson, Eaton, Gazelka, Klein, Lang, Latz, Lopez, Franzen, Miller, Newman, Newton, Putnam, Rosen, and Thomasoni, a quorum is present. Beginning under the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the messages. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House files herewith transmitted. House file numbers 3834 and 4221. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. No action is required. Moving to the fourth order of business, first reading of House bills. The House files are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the fifth order of business, reports of committee. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that committee reports printed in the agenda be adopted. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, the motion does prevail. Moving to the seventh order of business, second reading of House bills. The secretary will read the House file numbers. House file numbers 3285, 3768, 3805 and 3845. House files are given their second reading. Moving to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate bills. The bills on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the ninth order of business, we will adopt the author motion in one motion. All those in favor of the, the adoption, please signify by saying aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Remaining under order, uh, order of business, motions and resolutions. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills being made, uh, made special orders for immediate consideration, and the list should be on the desk. 
First bill on special orders today is Senate File 3885, number 51 on general order, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, Senate File 3885 authorizes the creation of paid family leave insurance in the state of Minnesota. For those in the public listening who may not know, insurance has to be authorized before it can be created in the state of Minnesota. So that's what this bill does. It's written broadly enough so that each individual employer can work directly with their insurance company to create the perfect package for their business and their unique employees' needs. And I think it is a simple solution to help expand access to paid family leave benefits in Minnesota, especially for those working for small businesses who are struggling to compete with the larger companies that already offer those benefits to their employees. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward bill, Mr. President, but with that, I do have the A3 amendment to get it in the shape I would like. Senator Coleman moves the A3 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Coleman moves to amend Senate file 3885 as follows, page one, line 20, delete. This is the A3 amendment. To the A3 amendment, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. The A3 amendment, it changes the portion that defines health care providers so that it's not exclusively for health care providers in Minnesota. That way, if, say, someone has a parent in Wisconsin or any other state, uh, that they, they qualify as well for these benefits. To the A3 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A3 amendment signify by saying aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President and members for adopting that uh, amendment. With that, the bill is in the shape I would like, and I'm happy to take any questions. Further discussion to Senate File 3885 as amended. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, would Senator Coleman yield for a question? She will yield, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Coleman, I, as we have discussed, I am really grateful that um, you are leading this effort, that there is an acknowledgement of how important access to paid leave is, um, what a disadvantage workers who work for smaller businesses are at in terms of accessing this important benefit. Um, you made brief reference to it in your remarks, and I'm wondering, could I ask you to please expand a little bit more on why, what this bill is doing compared to current law and why this will help increase and expand access? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Senator Kent, or Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kent, for the question. So what this bill does is allow for the creation of paid family leave insurance in Minnesota, which will offer a more affordable solution for small business small businesses to be able to offer their employees paid family leave benefits, thereby expanding access to those who cannot afford it currently. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Coleman. Um, I appreciate that, and like I said, I very much appreciate um, that this is trying to make a step uh, in a very badly needed direction. Folks, the United States of America is one of like only six nations in the world that does not offer paid leave of any kind. Six, and these are not well-known nations. We are in a, a group of basically small island countries in terms of not taking care of our families, our children, our babies, and making sure that people are able to care for each other. Um, the need is huge. Um, so members, I would like to offer the A4 amendment, please. Senator Kent moves the A4 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Kent moves to amend Senate file number 3885 as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause. This is the A4 amendment. To the A4 amendment, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, um, what you see before you is uh, the bill that I have authored essentially in the same general form for the past six years. Never had a hearing. Um, and it is currently my Senate file 1205. I want to thank my co-authors, Senator Port, Senator Ch Champion, Senator Putnam, and Senator Bach. Um, this is what we need to do. I've said on this floor before that 25 to 33 percent of mothers are not able to, to take leave and they have to go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. Nobody chooses to go back to work within two weeks 
after giving birth. That is not good for those mothers, that is not good for those babies, and that is not good for families. It's also not good for businesses. Members, I appreciate again that there is an effort here to expand access, but let's be very real. It will not expand access anywhere near enough to help particularly those 25 to 33 percent of mothers who go back to work two weeks after giving birth and their babies. It's not going to help people who have other family caregiving needs. Say you have a child with a serious injury or a serious illness. You need time off of work to do that. And parents in that position right now have to choose between being there with that, with that child and paying for, to put food on the table. And members, what we know is that when you have limited access, like this, uh, the, the Senate file 3885 will provide, is it's least likely to help those who need it the most. There are some people who are blessed and lucky and privileged that they have a spouse who has flexibility that they can step in, or they have enough income or enough resources of their own that they can take time off unpaid. But that's not the people who need it the most, and that's not where we see the greatest challenges and the greatest needs. Members, this amendment, the A4 amendment, would create at the most efficient, cost-efficient Mr. Price. President. Senator Kent, you'll suspend. Senator uh, Benson, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I rise to a point of order under 35.2, paragraph 2. This is a, a much broader proposal than the language that's in front of us, and I'd ask you to rule that it's not germane. I'm happy to give advice. Uh, Senator Benson has risen to a point of germaneness under 35.2. Advice Senator Benson first, then Senator Kent. Senator Benson. Um, Mr. President, whereas the underlying bill creates an insurance product or authorizes the creation of an insurance product, this in fact relates to data collection, a substantial expansion of um, a part of the Department of Economic of Employment and Economic Development. Um, it dictates uh, policies to employers. It, it has, as I said, expansive data collection, um, minimum benefit standards instead of letting an employer set the benefit standard that would work for their employees. And so, Mr. President, given the breadth of this bill, I would say that it does qualify as not being germane for an expansion of scope and purpose. Further advice, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I don't know how a bill, an amendment that would expand access to paid family and paid family leave is not germane to a bill that is absolutely, according to the author, intended to expand access to paid family leave. Um, this is uh, absolutely on point. Uh, it may be bigger than people would prefer, but it is germane to the absolute definition of the word germane. Further points of, uh, points of uh, advice, Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to offer the advice that you should find this point of order not well taken. Mr. President, 35.2 gives you two ways to rule this uh, amendment out of order. One, relates to a substantially different subject. I hope, Mr. President, you're not going to suggest to this body that a paid family leave amendment is not intended to relate to the purpose of a paid family leave bill. I'm assuming, Mr. President, 35.2 part one is not something you're considering. Then the question is, is the amendment going to be larger? Well, that's not the standard under 35.2, Mr. President. Two says, is intended to accomplish a substantially different purpose than that of the original bill. This amendment attempts to accomplish the purpose to provide paid family leave to Minnesota working men and women. That is the express purpose of the author in presenting this bill to the chamber. And for that reason, Mr. President, I think you should find the port of order not well taken. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Senator Senator Dibble, and then Senator Benson, I'll come back to you. Senator Dibble had his hand up. Senator Dibble points to the point of germaneness. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
Well, um, I hope uh, also that you find this point of order not well taken, unless you find that it is not the intention of the author of the bill to provide, actually provide paid family and medical leave. Now, I think we might have gotten a hint of that from Senator Benson's explanation of her point of order, in which she said it creates only simply a narrow insurance product, but Senator Coleman, in the presentation of her bill, said that the purpose is to provide paid family and medical leave. Senator Benson, in her explanation of her point of order, simply expounded on the fact that Senator Kent was offering a different policy approach to that same substantial purpose. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President. Senator Benson, further points to the point of germaneness. Mr. President, instead of um, the statutory authority under, I believe it's 63A, we have language that impacts the Commissioner of Management and Budget. We have language that impacts the Department of Human Services. Um, this is an expansive state program instead of a private program where employers are given the flexibility to choose. This is much more expensive and a larger expansion of government than anything that Senator Coleman brought to the floor. We are talking about an insurance product that helps small businesses. The amendment has a broad expansion of government authority and spending. Further points and advice for the President, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. On Senator Benson's last comments, no, the, our germaneness rule doesn't anywhere mention which agencies might deal with the law. I think Senator Friends point out that neither of the two points in 35.2 on what makes an amendment not germane would apply here, and as Senator Dibble pointed out, Senator Coleman explicitly said her bill was intended to increase access to family and medical leave. It was intentionally, it was exactly what she said the purpose of it is, and that's exactly what Senator Kent's amendment is. And Senator Benson, people do have different approaches to things. That's why we in the Senate are supposed to be debating different ways of accomplishing the same goal, the same purpose. That's exactly what Senator Kent's amendment does. And again, if, if, the, if we take the author of the bill is for what the intent of the bill is, it's very clearly the exact same purpose. Mr. Points, President, Senator final Benson. comment. Senator Coleman's purpose is to create private sector opportunities. The amendment's purpose is to create a massive government program. They are different in a very significant way. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I, I, I just want to say again, I'm taking Senator Coleman at her words, which was that she wants to expand access to paid family leave. That is what she said, which is different than what Senator Benson is saying. And so if, if, the, if the reason this is not germane is because what I'm trying to do is to truly provide access to paid family and medical leave to Minnesotans. And what this bill purports to do is to really just create a new product for insurance companies, then fine, we can, if that's the way we want to make the clarification, we can do it. But if we want to have an honest conversation about how we provide and ex expand and affordable and meaningful access to paid family and medical leave to care for our loved ones and ourselves and when we need it, then we should have this debate and people should vote on it, and we should not hide behind some procedural gymnastics in order to avoid that. Senator Dibble. Mr. President, I would encourage you to listen closely to Senator Benson's arguments in support of her motion, or whatever we call it, point of order, her request to you to make a ruling. Everything she's saying is a fair subject for debate. I respect her perspective on the points that she's making. We should debate those matters because what Senator Kent is proposing is a different avenue to the same end that Senator Coleman is proposing. So Senator Benson argues against her own point when she offers her arguments in support of, of arguing that this amendment is not germane. It is as germane as any amendment I've ever seen on the floor of the Senate. 
and to rule otherwise would set a very damaging precedent. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, advice to the um, argument. The argument being brought up is two words, expand access. Conveniently being left out our free market. Another two words that I said in my introduction. This bill, another piece being conveniently left out, prohibits the state from even being one of the insurers. We are looking for a pure free market solution by offering paid family leave insurance. The amendment is not germane. It is a completely different direction than the intent of this bill. Thank you, members. I made my decision. I rule that the point of order is well taken. The amendment is out of order. Senator Kim Mr. President, pursuant to Senate Rule 14.4, I appeal the ruling of the President and request a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. The Secretary will take the roll, uh, members, uh, just to read the uh, question before the body. The question is, shall the decision of the President be the judgment of the Senate? A green vote upholds the decision of the president. A red vote overrules the decision of the president. The secretary will take the roll. Calling Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes no. Eaton votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes no. Klein votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Lopez Franzen votes no. Lopez Franzen votes nay. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes no. Newton votes nay. Senator Friends. And Senator Putnam votes no. Putnam votes nay. Call on Senator Jasinski to report Thank members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye.
All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 30 nays, the decision of the president is sustained. Further discussion, Senator Torres Ray. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do have a couple of questions for Senator Coleman. Senator Coleman will yield. Senator Torres Ray. Uh, Senator Coleman, I have a lot of constituents who are very supportive of uh, family leave. They have been here for many years asking for this. And I need to clarify to them what this bill does. I need to let them know exactly what is proposed here because many of them are confused. Uh, could you clarify in section two, and, and again, you know, this is, for constituents who, who are very excited about the possibility. And in section two, if we understand this correctly, if I understand this correctly, it just says that an insurance company licensed to issue disability income insurance policy in Minnesota may also offer paid family leave insurance. That's it. So am I understanding this correctly when I say to my constituents that your bill simply provides an opportunity or, or, or opens the door for insurance companies to offer an insurance policy for family leave. Is, is that correct? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President, and um, thank you, Senator Torres Ray. Uh, yes, that is what this bill does. It authorizes the creation of paid family leave insurance in the state of Minnesota. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Coleman. So uh, a small business will have to purchase this insurance if it becomes available through this law. We're not offering any support to this business, correct? We're not, we're not providing uh, funding for it. We're not giving them flexibility. There's nothing in here for the small business to actually pay for this or do anything with it. Simply is available, is in the market. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Torres Ray. That's a, a great question. So, this bill simply authorizes the creation of paid family leave insurance in the state of Minnesota. However, the taxes bill that will be coming before us later this week does offer tax credits for businesses with fewer than 50 employees to cover paid family leave expenses, including the purchase of the insurance. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Senator Goldman. So this bill does not do really anything for small businesses. It just really doesn't offer any, any incentives, any funding, any support, really nothing. It just tells, you know, people in the state of Minnesota, uh, insurance companies could, could simply offer this. And you small businesses, you're on your own and figure it out. So my question to you, Senator Coleman, is do you know what is the cost? Let's just say that this bill passes today, which I, I think it will. Um, and so insurance companies are able to offer that, and I'm a small business owner, and I want to purchase this. What is the cost for me? What, what, what do I have to do? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Torres Ray. Uh, the answer that I've gotten in talking to interested insurance providers is that it will be priced pretty similarly, similarly to that of short-term disability insurance, which is readily available and relatively affordable for small businesses right now. And the beauty of this, and I disagree that it doesn't uh, offer anything for small businesses, is it does offer an affordable and flexible option for small businesses to provide paid family leave benefits for their employees in a way that doesn't have a mandate, a threat of fine, or another tax. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. President, and, and thank you, Senator Coleman. I, I wanted to make sure that uh, we provide this information to our constituents' members. Uh, people are very excited when they hear that we are going to move policy forward for paid family leave, and this is just not. This is not what this is. So I hope that constituents were listening. This is just simply an open door for insurance companies to offer more insurance policies more insurance options that small businesses simply cannot afford. 
That's the problem we have. So we're not solving the problem with this bill. I obviously cannot vote against something that it really is presented to do something that it doesn't. <laughs> That's the problem here. And this is why our constituents get so confused. They get very excited, so they are calling me and say, oh, you're solving this problem finally. Uh, we aren't. So don't vote for something that confuses the public, that intends to give a message that is absolutely the opposite of what we need to do today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, just for the record, I think that the public ought to know what's going on. But uh, I think there's a little misinformation floating around here this morning, and I think that's unfortunate. This bill allows the insurance company to get into the market. Currently, they are not allowed to be in the market of the state of Minnesota. So there are folks in this room that would certainly like to see another government program, expand that government program, hire a bunch of people to run it, and then start surcharging the, the uh, small businesses to pay for it. We've been up and down this road. There's some of us in this room member remember very well how the Affordable Care Act worked. There's some of us in this room remember very well how Minlars worked. Three strikes and we're out. And this would probably be the third strike if it's going to be a government program. But let's not say that this isn't going to help small businesses because I don't think that's a fair statement. Our small businesses right now do not have the opportunity to purchase a policy and to participate in the payment of that policy for the employees. This would give them the opportunity to do that. So I think there's a lot of uh, rhetoric going on here that's probably uh, uh, not quite fitting what's happening here today. And let's keep in mind, in order for a product like this to be sold in Minnesota, we have to give the companies a statutory right to do it. And one of the reasons that this is being brought in under the dis disability part of it, because that's an area that the actuarialists work with, and those actuarialists will be able to work, fit this in very well to work with this to come up with accurate pricing and accurate loss, pro potential losses and things like that. Now we can call it a loss or we can call it time off, whatever you want to call it, but still, when it comes to insurance, the product is priced by the cost of putting that product on the market, the claims that will come in on that product and what the results in the end would be. Keep in mind the state of Minnesota, the Department of Commerce regulates things pretty closely and regulates the profits that insurance companies can make in the state of Minnesota. So uh, I, think we're, uh, I think we need to give this a chance because I think it's something that will work and I think it's something that many of our small businesses will welcome to have the opportunity to put this, place, put this in place in their small business. A lot of these small businesses are having a problem competing because the bigger businesses are putting in something on their own. So this is another opportunity to help our small businesses survive. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if Senator Dames would yield, please. He will, Senator Johnson Stewart. Uh, Senator Dames, I uh, own a company, I employ 35 employees, and I pay unemployment insurance. Can you help me understand, is unemployment insurance a private product or is that administered by the government? Senator Dames. I think it's kind of interesting, you're as asking a question that as an employer, I would assume you would know, but maybe you don't, so I'll answer it for you. Unemployment is a government program. Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Dames. Actually, I was suspecting it was, and I'm so pleased that the government does such a great job of, of administering unemployment insurance. I only wish I had a similar product. Uh, Senator, uh, to cover my employees for leave, I wonder if Senator Coleman would yield, please. She will, Senator Johnson Stewart. Uh, Senator Coleman, uh, Senator Torres Ray already asked the question of how much this would cost. As an employee of 35 people, I'm very interested in that. Um, I'm wondering, under this plan, uh, if I decided to opt in and I decided to cover my employees, but all of a sudden they started getting pregnant like crazy, and I thought maybe this is going to be too expensive, can I cancel it at any time under your provision? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Stewart, this bill will operate a lot like short-term disability because it will be under the same regulations. Senator Johnson-Stewart. Okay, that's helpful because under my 
short-term, long-term, and life insurance policy, I actually can cancel that at any time. Um, and so uh, it seems that if it's starting to get a little bit too expensive under this plan, I could cancel it. I don't know if that's really great for my employees, but it certainly is good news for me as an employer. I have more questions, but for now, thank you very much. Further discussion to Senate File 3885 as amended. Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate File Number 3885, a bill for an act relating commerce authorizing certain insurers to offer paid family leave insurance benefits. Third reading. Final discussion to Senate File 3885 as amended. Senator Dietzik. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. I took my mask off and lost my earring. Um, would Senator Coleman yield for some questions? She will yield, Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. So under Section 2, and, and thank you, Senator Coleman. I haven't heard this bill. I'm not in commerce, so I haven't heard this bill. Under Section 2, it talks about an insurance company licensed to issue disability company may offer a policy or offer insurance benefits providing wage replacements for employees' income loss due to birth or adoption of a child or employee, and then placement of the child with the employee for foster care. Would this policy, could you use this policy to cover if you had a pregnancy complication like preeclampsia or if you had a miscarriage? Could you use this policy to, if you had to stay at home due to that? Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, we already have medical wage replacement insurance in the state of Minnesota through short-term and long-term disability, so that would be unnecessary in this bill. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Coleman continue to yield? She will continue to yield. Senator Dietzik. So when, when we apply for insurance, you know, we go through that. When you re-up your, um, when you do your health insurance, it asks you, do you want long-term disability, short-term disability? Will that be asked at that point? And can you only take this at one? Can you only sign up for this, you know, well in advance? Or let's say my, you know, I have a, father that, you know, when my dad was in the hospital, I spent a lot of time there and was able to rotate because we weren't in session, so I was able to rotate with my other siblings of um, who was going to help take care of them. But if we didn't have that flexibility, would I be able to, at that point, apply for this insurance or do I have to apply for it well in advance of, um, you know, when we do that reinsurance, when we sign up for insurance? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dedzik. So this would operate like any other insurance benefit that employers offer their employees. I'm sure that when looking at, for a job, this will be one of the first questions people ask in the interviews. Do you provide paid family leave insurance? Uh, so it would operate much like it does with short-term disability. Senator Dedzik. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman, though, do you have to sign up for it well in advance, or can you, like my dad went in the hospital, we knew that he would have to maybe go to transitional care, or my mom would need help. Would I be able to sign up to it at that point, or would I have had to sign up for it earlier? Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dedzik. Um, I can't think of a, a situation insurance, for example, after a car accident, you can get car insurance for that incident um, that this would be applicable, applicable similarly. So no, I don't think you could sign up for it after the event, um, as far as I'm aware. Senator, Dietz Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Senator Coleman. Um, the next question I have is, so on page, so we I, we, I think we do definitions of the armed forces of the United States. There's a definition on 1.8 to include the National Guard and Reserve. Um, and I appreciate that because I believe the federal, some of the federal bill allows um, if, if for family members and have special situations for family members with service members. Um, and then on line 3.3, it talks about care for family service members injured in the line of duty. Technically, service member is not um, defined. I think we all know what it means. But I'm just curious if you had consideration 
because um, we've talked a lot about public safety and we all know that our first responders are, um, they also get injured in the line of duty and family members might need to take care of them. We've had MnDOT employees or Department of Correction employees get injured in the line of duty and so I'm wondering um, why that that is just for service members or does this mean like if somebody gets injured and they have to, a family member has to fly over to, you know, they're, they're at um, in the hospital in Germany. Could you clarify that? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dietzik. I believe that's covered under Section 2.24, when it says participate in providing care, including physical or psychological care for a family member of the employee made necessary by the family member's serious health condition. So if you're injured in any job and you need someone to stay home and take care of you, that would qualify. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you, Mr. President. But that's if the, um, you know, so the continuing supervision by a health care provider in that serious health condition is as defined by an insurance policy. So it depends on what your insurance policy has. If your insurance policy isn't broad, we all know car insurance policies, you have to read that fine print. When my, when my glass, you know, I got, the car got hit by something and so then the glass shattered, my front windshield shattered, you know, I didn't read the fine print. And so the cost was about $450 and my coverage started at $500. So, you know, you have to read that fine print and so that you know, may or may not be covered. And so does that care for service family member injured in the light of duty relate back to under a serious health condition or is it for other instances? She will continue to yield, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Dietzik. I believe this is also taken care of in line 3.4, where it says take other leave to provide care for a family member or other family leave as specified in an insurance policy. So it can be tailored to each employer's unique employee needs if that is one of the needs of their employee. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you again. So it is specified in the insurance policy. And so uh, I just want to caution people. I think that we do need to offer paid family leave and we do need to look at this, but um, you know, a lot of it depends on what is in that actual policy. So as we move forward, I would encourage people to read that fine line because what is in that fine print may or may not make it um, the policy worth purchasing. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I am a mother of two daughters, and uh, caregiving, you know, has played a central role in my life. Um, and for me, it's an act rooted in joy and love. And you know, caring for whether you're caring for parents, your children, infants whether it's planned or unexpected, caregiving can also be really unpredictable. And Minnesotans need a paid family leave policy that they can rely on, that is easily understandable, that won't change on the whims of their employers, that is equal for everyone. And I believe that you know, Minnesota supports people who take on that necessary, absolutely necessary caregiving role. And if we were to recognize and alleviate the burden that that role places on Minnesotans and to be fully supportive of new parents, of all of our caregivers, we have to create a policy that meets the needs of Minnesotans. And Minnesotans need a paid family leave policy that is equitable, supportive of everyone, and not tied to the scrutiny of the employer or the insurance industry, and what they decide they can cover and when. Minnesotans need reliable, affordable, accessible paid family medical leave, and this bill is not it. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm hearing from a lot of constituents, I think we all are, about the need for paid family and medical leave, something they really say is a matter of fairness, something we really ought to care about as a society. And I was hoping today with paid family medical leave on the agenda that we'd actually have a chance to do that. But as the germane this fight earlier pointed out, we're not going to because instead we've got a choice of whether we want a, some sort of insurance plan that some employers may choose to take up on and some employees may be able to benefit from on if they can afford it, if their employer offers it, if everything else. And people aren't asking for that. They're asking for paid family and medical leave. If your kid or your spouse or relative is sick, 
You need time. This doesn't do any of that for anything. It gives somebody a new, quote, insurance product. And I'm glad some people like insurance products, but I think what people want is paid family and medical leave. And unfortunately, we don't get a chance to talk about Senator Kent's bill, so I'll just say that I think that the people of Minnesota who've been asking for this are going to be deeply disappointed because this does nothing that's going to help them. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Coleman yield for a question? Senator Coleman will yield. Senator Frentz. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Senator Coleman, thank you for raising this topic. We're, we're being asked by a lot of Minnesotans to get paid family leave and to provide for some of this care time. And for that, I would say, good, we had some discussion. Uh, my question, Senator Coleman, relates to your comments about the omnibus tax bill that's coming and the funding for this provision that's in there. As I understand it, Senator Coleman, that would allow employers up to $3,000 credit per employee for those with 50 employees or less and a total funding of about $16 million. Senator Coleman, my question is, is it your presentation of this bill to this body that that money will act as an incentive for employers to go ahead and purchase these private policies? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Friends, for the, the question. Not necessarily as an incentive, but as a tool for those who are interested to assist in purchasing this product or uh, offering any type of paid family leave benefit for their employees. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Coleman. The reason I ask is that we have about 2.8 million working men and women in this state. And if we were to divide the 16 million by 3,000 per employee, it would appear to me this uh, funding would provide coverage for about 5,300 Minnesotans. In other words, about one in every 500. And I think the debate we're having here is that most working men and women want to have this benefit and how are we gonna provide it and how are we gonna put it across the finish line so that people can stay home when they need to. And I think that offers benefits. As a small business owner myself, I'd like to have employees say we can do this. So I'm just calling attention to the fact, members, that the, the incentive, if you will, in the tax omnibus bill is not gonna move us to where everyone gets this benefit. And I can't resist, Mr. Pre President, Senator Dams, you mentioned government run um, and the inefficiencies. And while it's true there are some stories to tell in my district um, I have not received a single complaint about Medicare from a constituent in all the years I've been in the Senate and I have yet to receive any complaints about the administration of Social Securities and some of my favorite constituents talk about the very excellent job the government did running our military efforts in World War II so just put a little plug in there that the government can do some stuff right once in a while and thank you very much members and thank you Mr. President. Any final? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President uh, and members, I have a, a sibling. Um, her husband is not well, and she often has to take care of him, spend a little time away from work. And unfortunately, uh, they work in, uh, or she works in a service sector job, not paid a lot, and when she does that, she has to take an economic hit. She has to make that choice uh, between being paid and taking care of her husband. And it is a tremendous hardship. And I have another sister um, who works, she's one of our heroes, works on the front lines taking care of people. And uh, she got sick and had COVID and thankfully she has uh, big loving family and a lot of siblings who rallied around her because her husband was not in a position, also works in a service sector job and uh, could not take the time away. And so uh, we scoop, swooped in and took care of her during that period of time. Um, and she of course had to take time away uh, and wasn't paid fully. Mr. President, uh, members, Senator Kent said earlier, we're one of only seven countries in the world that doesn't allow people to take care of themselves or their family in those moments. Senator Kent had a proposal that she offered that would have been extremely affordable and would have gotten a benefit that everyone else in the rest of the world has figured out except us. allowing people to be much, much healthier, 
much more present, much more ready and able for those employers when they're at work. Senator Coleman's proposal was ruled as the only subject that we can talk about today. And in so doing, I think the majority revealed that the intention of Senator Coleman's proposal was not to make sure everyone can have paid time to care for themselves or loved ones, but simply to create a very narrow insurance product. Senator Dibble, you'll suspend for just a second. Senator Kiffmeyer, for what Thank you, Mr. Do you President. Rise? I never like to interrupt, but you know, when you start talking about somebody's intention, that is similar to a motive, and I just want to be sure that we don't go that direction. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Senator Kiffmeyer, yes, uh, motives obviously are in Masons. However, uh, I don't believe that he necessarily strayed too far off the pattern for this one. Um, we need to be careful about interrupting people again. We've been through this before. Um, so, Senator, Senator Dibble, you will continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and Senator Kiffmeyer, just to be clear in response to your claim that I was uh, attributing motive, I wasn't. I was attributing uh, the statements that Senator Benson made in arguing to rule Senator Kent's amendment not germane. Uh, and also simply citing the effective and objective outcome of Senator Coleman's proposal, which by Senator Coleman's own description of her own bill does not ensure that all Minnesotans, regardless of where they fall in our economic sector, if they're at a frontline service sector job or at a Fortune 500 company making a lot of money, not everyone is going to be able to benefit from the idea that she has in front of us. It's only, only going to cover those whose employers decide to purchase this insurance product. We don't know the level or the extent of the coverage. It's not going to be available for their own health issues to tend to. There's going to be no requirement that everyone is applied equally. It's, there's no requirement um, that pre-existing conditions are taken into consideration. There's no protection from losing one's job if they do take a little bit of time away from their, from their job. None of those guarantees, none of those protections, no universality. People will continue to suffer with tremendous hardship in their lives, totally unnecessarily. Senators can't Kent's proposal is not far out or far off. It's eminently workable. It's been demonstrated in country after country after country and other states around this country. Mr. President, this is not a paid family and medical leave proposal. This is an insurance, a private, a narrow private insurance product proposal. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Kent. Deferring to Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. President. <sighs> well, I'm an employer, and I was very excited to hear about this proposal as well. Uh, I have paid for my employees to take time off to care for their loved ones. Uh, I have one employee right now whose wife has had cancer for several years, and right now it costs me his full hourly rate to pay for him to spend 32 hours a week caring for his wife and his three small children. I do that because I do actually care about my employees. I care about families. I care about women and children and keeping my word that I'm going to be a good employer. Uh, I've paid for employees to take care of their mothers. Uh, luckily enough, when my mother died of leukemia, I was able to arrange for myself to be with her the whole time so she could die in her home. But this comes at no bargain to me. Uh, it only comes as a reflection of my values, which is that 
Uh, I want my employees to be full individuals and have family and be able to spend time with them. I am one of the women that we read about recently in the Star Tribune, one of the many women in Minnesota who go back to work within weeks of having a baby. Actually, I was working at Dunwoody at the time. I had a baby on Monday, and I was back teaching the following Monday um, because Dun I was one of the few female employees. Dunwoody wouldn't have considered back in the 90s that it was cost beneficial to provide family or medical leave, and I wish I would have had that, which is why I provide it to my employees. Uh, I currently pay about $685 a year for each of my employees to be covered by um, short-term, long-term disability and life insurance, and anybody in this room can go online and see what it might cost. The only information I have uh, from the floor is that this would cost me about the same as short-term disability. Well, the input variables, let's say that I'm shopping for this for myself, the input variables are your gender, the type of work you do, the amount of money you make, and I think that's about it. So putting in all kinds of different um, input variables, if I actually am going to insure my employees as construction workers, I'm going to pay about twice as much as if they're technical workers. You can go through the, the whole exercise, but basically it costs a lot more to insure yourself if you're female, if you're in uh, the reproductive kind of years of your life, if you make a decent living wage, and if you do light office work. This is not leave, this is not an option for me. I don't want to pay for more insurance that isn't valuable. This would double my insurance, uh, provide no real benefit to my employees because as we all know, private insurance gets to choose what it covers. Uh, I am much more comfortable with a program uh, like the governor has proposed, that would actually allow me to have some insurance that my employees could take private, or I mean, could take family leave. That's what it means to be an employer who values your employees. That's what it means for me to be somebody who cares about families. That's what it means for me to be somebody who supports real life. We don't plan ahead for cancer. We don't plan ahead for Man, I never planned that my mom would get sick. And to make things worse, she got sick in December. I mean, she didn't even help me out by planning early in my year so I could budget for it. Um, we don't plan ahead for children needing care after they're born. We don't plan ahead for preeclampsia, as my uh, colleague, Senator Dietzik, said. This is, pre this is not the kind of insurance I'm looking for as an employee, and I'll look forward to something um, better, but I'm voting no on this. Thank you, Mr. President. Any final discussion? Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Coleman yield for a question? She will yield. Senator Pratt. Senator Coleman. Um, you're using the private insurance market as, an op as, a, as a vehicle for uh, making paid family medical leave available. Are there any other states that are following a similar path? Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Pratt. There are a couple of other states, I believe three others. Uh, Minnesota would be the fourth with the most similar proposal recently passing in Virginia. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Senator Coleman, for that. There's been some talk about comparison to unemployment, and I just want to I just want to talk about that since we've had uh, we had over 75 days of discussion of unemployment from the time the Senate passed it until we finally got uh, a deal. And Senator Johnson Stewart mentioned that you, unemployment insurance worked very well during the pandemic, and it did. It really did. But let's not forget the state racked up a $1.5 billion debt on that insurance coverage and erased a $1.7 billion deficit, or I'm sorry, reserve. That loan was backed by the federal government. If paid family medical leave 
in the House version were to overextend itself, that debt would fall on Minnesota families. And we just talked about uh, how certain businesses uh, will self-insure. I think what we just heard was a description of self-insured. My employees are out and I provide this benefit. How great would it be if a company that's self-insuring today could buy a product and join a risk pool and share those costs with other like-minded employers? That's what this proposal is about. I appreciate Senator Coleman's approach. As she mentioned, there are other states that are, are following this, this uh, path, this strategy, and uh, Senator Coleman's added some improvements upon it. Uh, we've discussed how difficult it is uh, to find and attract talent, and smaller employers are having an especially hard time because they can't compete with the benefit set that the larger employers can offer. Members, this puts employers on a level playing field. This allows our small employers to compete with our large employers. And she also realized, um, as she went through this, that the reason no one has access to this coverage is because, as Senator Dames mentioned, the Department of Commerce won't let these policies be written. What a novel idea. Why don't, we, why don't we remove a barrier that's keeping this type of coverage from, uh, uh, from an employer and an employee, rather than implement a new department, have a government-run insurance program again that is not free, that will require about a half a billion dollars in new payroll taxes. So for those who are saying that, boy, it'd be nice if I could offer this through a government program, they're gonna be paying a half a billion dollars in new payroll taxes. It's not free. So I appreciate that she looked at what other states are doing. She's looking at the trends that are out there. She's looking at the mistakes that other states have made and have built in improvements along the line. And she's helping our small business compete for the talent they most desperately need. Mr. President, I urge a green vote on Senate File 3885. Senator Johnson-Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Sen Mr. Uh, President. Just a point of clarification. Uh, my company has been in business since 1995. Uh, I have been glad to pay unemployment insurance for, I don't know, what is that, 26, 27 years. Uh, I did not reference unemployment insurance during the pandemic. And I think the pandemic, we would all agree, is an unusual situation. I don't expect that if we get a government um, supported family and medical leave insurance program, suddenly people are going to be going on leave like crazy. I mean, that's, I can't even imagine what that would happen unless we had a sudden influx of unplanned pregnancies or something like that. So I do want to bring up the fact that while unemployment insurance is a government-run insurance that is an excellent program, my mom, who had AML, long uh, leukemia, she had paid for years for long-term health care insurance. So private insurance is not always what it's racked up to be. She had paid for years for long-term care insurance. My family and I were very grateful for that when she got sick. But guess what? She died two days before that insurance even went into effect. Um, I just had my professional liability insurance canceled at my company because the company that has insured us for 27 years suddenly decided that we were too risky. I think to pretend that the insurance companies treat us fairly, that we can rely on them to take care of our employees is um, suspect. Uh, for my own self, I know that I've had lots of surprises from private insurance companies, and I think if I'm going to rely on a family leave program, I can, I can uh, 
For my employees, I can think of no better way for it to be administered as a public program, much like unemployment insurance. So thank you for allowing me to clarify, Mr. President. Senator Howell. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Senator Coleman, for allowing families to plan. I will tell you that as a firefighter, I watched a lot of my fellow firefighters get cancer, which prompted me to plan. I took out a cancer policy. I carry that policy today for cancer because I knew the likelihood that that might happen. So, Senator Coleman, this gives families an opportunity to plan. It gives businesses an opportunity, especially small businesses, an opportunity to compete. So thank you, Senator Coleman. This will be a very good opportunity for businesses and families to plan for their future. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise in opposition to this bill. Um, I'm looking for actual family paid medical leave. And one of the problems that I see with this bill is that it really does put the onus on planning, what we just heard. Um, it counts on people being organized enough, having the resources enough, and being able to plan to opt in proactively to this type of insurance. So we're going to have a lot of people who don't, right? Most Minnesotans probably are not going to pay into this. Most people, <laughs> I hate to tell you, don't plan a lot of things in their lives, right? Most people are not that organized. Many children are also not planned. Um, people find out that they're pregnant, and maybe they didn't buy this insurance ahead of time, and they don't get this paid leave if they didn't opt in before. So none of those people would be covered by this? Seems wrong. And it also seems wrong that people wouldn't be covered who, for example, might have to spend time, a long time in a hospital due to a pregnancy. That period until they are leaving to take care of their own children when they're discharged in their home, that that period isn't covered by this is also really problematic. This is a pay to play scheme in my mind. This is pay to play. This is profit mongering, disguised as care. But it's not care. It doesn't really cover people unless they're wealthy and organized. So I'm going to vote against this, and I urge you colleagues to see this for what it is. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, let's talk about what this bill is. This bill empowers Minnesotans. It allows. Minnesota, it allows Minnesotans to have paid family leave insurance as a rider on a group insurance policy. Now, contrary to some of the comments that I've heard on the floor here, um, you know, yep, insurance has premiums. We don't necessarily always uh, trust all of the plans. But let me just say, insurance does what it's supposed to do. It is the law of big numbers. Insurance allows people to have the coverage that they need that can be exorbitant costs, but because it's the law of big numbers, it provides that coverage that one could not afford on their own. And for all too long in our state, Minnesotans have been robbed of the opportunity to use the innovative insurance products that meet the growing needs of today. For far too long, Minnesotans were not allowed to um, have more modern life insurance policies that allowed for um, having riders for long-term care insurance. Our, our state didn't, didn't do that right away. And Minnesotans were forced with only the long-term care model that only had those higher premiums. We need to allow Minnesotans the opportunity to have innovative insurance products that meet the needs of today. And that is what this bill does. And let's not, let's not lose sight of the fact 
that employees, according to the 2020 Employee Benefit Research Institute, they found that more employees want less paid leave but higher wages. 20, they would rather have higher wages than lower wages and paid leave. And let's not lose sight of the fact, how well does the government run these programs? Would you rather deal with a government-run program with no flexibility, as if we're all the same? No, we need to let Minnesotans choose. That is what this bill does. It is a step into the world that we live in today. This is an innovative insurance product. I am glad that Minnesotans, that passing this bill off of our floor today, I thank Senator Coleman for her insight, for the innovation, and this is something that Minnesotans need. It is empowering Minnesotans, and I trust Minnesotans. I think Minnesotans can plan. I don't believe that government is the be-all and the end-all about every aspect of our lives. Let's empower Minnesotans. Let's vote green on this bill. Further final comments? Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, I will say uh, a benefit here is that we're actually starting to talk about this issue in a fairly in-depth way. Um, I have had this bill for six years. It has never been given a hearing. Now, fortunately, over in the House and the other body, they have also had the same bill with a lot of hearings, dozens of hearings over the past several years, passed it at least one time. And the brilliance of our process is that stakeholders have come forward, talked about the challenges, talked about how it would affect a particular industry, how it would affect different people, and they have responded, and we have, they've been able to craft that bill in response. We have not had that opportunity here in the Senate. The Minnesota Senate has not felt it worth our efforts to give it a hearing and to talk about this issue in the level of detail that it needs, because Minnesotans need it. And so it's not surprising to me that I'm hearing people say things that are, do not reflect they're saying things about my proposal that do not reflect the reality of that proposal because it had not a hearing. So I appreciate the senator from Rochester talking about the law of big numbers. Well, guess what, folks? You want to know where big numbers are? When you insure every single Minnesotan. When every Minnesota worker has access to it, that's when you really get the big numbers, and that's when you really get the affordability. The average cost per employee is about $360 a year. I'm real sure that that's not what we're going to find in any kind of decent policy that's being offered by insurance companies. There were critiques about um, the, you know, it's just a big government program and it's a new thing and it's going to fail because the government always fails. Well, here's the thing. This bill, this language was modeled off of the program in the state of Washington, which is successful, because their system and our system are similar. And we can learn from theirs and build off of what we know works and make it work for Minnesota. And we've been talking about the UI system so much today. This is built on the exact same architecture as the UI system. And with one last little point to make here about how this works, when you talk about the UI system and, uh, and, and particularly paid family and medical leave, which is available in about 10 states right now, it just got a really good stress test in a historic pandemic, and they worked, and they served the people well, and we should be doing the same thing here in Minnesota. The other thing that I keep hearing in this conversation today is what all of us are far too familiar with, which is a patchwork of coverage of insurance. And you know what we all know is where the gaps are. And so here we are, we're gonna put another patchwork on that quilt, and we're going to say this is going to cover it, and we know it's not. And again, we know that this is most likely to be picked up by companies and businesses with higher wage employees who probably have the same privileges that we're used to. And the people who need this the most 
and are in the most desperate position of having to choose between whether or not they can take care of their baby or their loved ones or themselves or put food on the table and pay rent, this proposal is very likely not actually going to serve them. I did a little, little Googling while this has been going on and I found that there are about 70,000 babies born in the state of Minnesota each year. And I'm gonna go back to the statistic that I keep quoting ad nauseum because everybody needs to understand this in their hearts. 25 to 33% of mothers go back to work within two weeks of giving birth. If you take that number, take the midpoint, apply that to 70,000, that works out to about 20,000 babies whose mothers are leaving them within two weeks. Child care doesn't start for infants until six weeks. What does that mother do? How do people make choices when that's what they're facing? And folks, I had a conversation with somebody about this not too long ago, and it dawned on me that we don't take puppies away from their mothers before eight to nine weeks if we can help it. But we as a society have decided that we want to take better care of puppies than babies and their mothers and their families. So, as I said, I'm glad this conversation is finally happening in the Minnesota Senate. But let's not kid ourselves and let's not kid the people of Minnesota. This is not going to solve it. Thank you. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this proposal is coming from a mother who gave birth to her first child without any access to paid family leave benefits, from a mother who understands the importance of expanding access to paid family leave for Minnesotans. We've heard the call from Minnesotans to expand access to paid family leave, but we have also heard the cries of distress from our small businesses who are still reeling, still recovering from when Tim Walls shut them down. We hear them saying, I don't need another threat of fine. I don't need another mandate. I don't need another tax. What I need is assistance to be able to compete with the large corporations already offering generous paid family leave benefits to their employees. What I need is an affordable option to offer these expanded benefits to my employees. I'm glad that the esteemed senator from Woodbury brought up the state of Washington, who in the last two years after enacting their paid family leave government program recently announced that they will be increasing their paid family leave payroll taxes on their small businesses by 50%. Is that what our small businesses need right now when they are still recovering from the pandemic and the shutdowns? I don't think so. What they need is an innovative and collaborative response, and that's what this bill does. It authorizes the creation of an insurance product in the state of Minnesota, which sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. In the state of Virginia, they recently passed a very similar proposal with near unanimous bipartisan support. So what are Virginia Democrats getting wrong here, is what I have to wonder. This bill will do so much good for our small businesses. This bill will do so much good for Minnesota families and continue to make Minnesota an even better place to live, work, and raise a family, and I urge a green vote. Thank you. Senator lopez friends. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members. And this opposition of this bill is coming from a mom who also had two children while working in this body as a small business owner and who still has a small business that's grappling with issues of the pandemic. In, in actuality, our business has actually done pretty good and is moving forward. But I would say, members, families really need support, not the appearance of it. Again, as a mother, as a small business owner and employer, and before I go to the merits of this bill, which I want to start by voicing my concern with the process of how this debate has gone. Mr. President and members, the minority has their voice. The minority has ideas. Senator Kent's proposal on the same subject matter was voted down as not germane. And while I was not on the floor at that moment, because we're trying to wrap up negotiations of this session, 
I do want to be on the record expressing my deep concern on the ruling of the President. This body has the ability to have serious conversations about serious bills and paid family leave. I agree with Senator Kent. Thank you for starting that conversation, but don't shut it down on procedure because you don't want to debate the merits of it. That is not the, the role of a deliberative body in the Minnesota Senate. We need to have the ability to debate the bills, and our amendment was germane to a paid family leave. Senator Franzen, Lopez Franzen, to the bill, not to the germaneness issue, to the bill. Thank you, Senator Mr. Lopez Franzen. Mr. President, with all due respect, I am doing my closing remarks on a paid family leave bill, and I, as the minority leader, will ask to please not be interrupted. Senator Lopez Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President. This is Women's Health Week, National Women's Health Week. And this is the solution we have in front of us to help with this grappling of balancing families and kids and businesses. We do it all, right? If we want to support families, if we want to support women and mothers in particular, let's start by guaranteeing them their reproductive rights. This bill is a distraction. Again, the answer of the GOP is to buy more insurance. That's the GOP solution. Members, I don't know if you looked at your Twitter feed in the last hours, just found out that the United Health CEO, former United Healthcare CEO, was compensated $142.2 million. We don't need another insurance market, market to give more profits to people. We need to actually have a product, which is the, the proposal that Senator Kent has moved forward for six years and pleading for our deliberative body to actually speak on. That is a solution to a problem, giving everybody, small, large businesses alike, the ability to provide a real solution real paid family and medical leave, not insurance. Members, nothing is free in this world, and I heard my colleagues talk about how this cost compared to the unemployment insurance bill or you know, marketplace that we have here. Someone always pays, and in this case, who is paying that price? Families, mothers. I don't know about you, but my pregnancies were not really planned. And if we want to go in, in, into the difference of experiences, everyone has them. We have very, a variety of experiences that insurance doesn't necessarily um, squarely meet. So members, it's great that you have an idea of how you think you can solve this problem. But again, if you want to empower families, women in particular on Women's Health Week, don't throw insurance at us. Give us real solutions. And finally, I would say, this bill is just a skeleton. It's missing a lot of meat. Let's really find ways to talk about paid family leave without distracting from the issue at hand. Again, members, I support uh, the discussion of real paid family leave, and I urge members for a red vote on this illusion. Thank you. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Coleman, for bringing this bill forward. Senate Republicans are very excited today about the innovation that's happening in Minnesota. Yes, it's not what everybody wants, but the reality is this is an innovative bill. Somebody said that we are the exception. I would say that we are exceptional in this state, in this country, in trying to innovate. We've been known for innovation, and here we are coming to the market again with an innovation that will help Minnesotans. We have done the Minnesotan thing. We have listened to Minnesotans. We've listened to the families. We've listened to the workers. We've listened to the employers and the industry. And we've come together and balanced these things, balanced the employers, balanced the families and their taxes and what's going to happen to them. We have balanced what the state needs are, what the industry needs are, with an innovative product. Today you should be excited. I woke up this morning, somebody asked me, you know, how are you doing today? Well, it's going to be a great day in Minnesota. 
And here, one of the things that we are bringing forward, Senate Republicans are bringing forward to the state of Minnesota, to the Minnesotans, to have an opportunity to fill the needs the Minnesotans have been asking for. I am excited to support this bill, and I think you should be as well. And I am proud of Minnesotans and the work that we're doing here at the Senate. So, folks, I urge that you support the Senator Coleman bill with a green vote today. Thank you. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate File 3885 as amended. Call on Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rood votes aye. Rood votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Call on Senator Frentz to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Why, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eaton votes no. Eaton votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Klein votes no. Klein votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes no. Newton votes nay. Senator Frentz. Senator Putnam votes no. Pet Putnam votes nay. Senator Frentz. And Senator Fate votes no. Senator Fate votes nay. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 37 ayes and 29 nays, Senate File 3885 does, as amended does pass and is titled Agreed To. Members, next bill on the agenda is House File 3216, number 41, on special orders, or on general orders, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, this is a bill addressing the Local Road Improvement Program Advisory Committee. What it does is it adds a township representative to this committee. Uh, for those who don't know, the Local Road Improvement Program provides funding assistance to local agencies for constructing or reconstructing local roads. Uh, the projects are selected through a fairly competitive uh, solicitation process using criteria and recommendations from this committee. So this gives townships a voice on this committee. It was passed unanimously out of local government, state government, as well as transportation, and there have been no uh, concerns raised uh, to date. Discussion to House File 3216. Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill third reading. House File Number 3216, a bill for an act relating to transportation. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill its roll call vote.
Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Friends. I report Senator Kunish votes aye. Kunish votes aye. Senator Friends. And I report Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Torres Ray votes aye. Call on Senator Jasinski to report members reporting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 30, 63 ayes and no nays, House File 3216 does pass it. It's title agreed to. Next, uh, next bill members is Senate File 4165, number num 91 on, special, on general orders, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senate File 4165. Um, is a very important bill. If those who believe that grammar and syntax is critically important in our governmental documents, this is a reviser's instruction to change SNAP language. But Mr. President, the bill is too long. I'd like to move the A43 amendment. Senator Abler moves the A43 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Abler moves to amend Senate file number 4165 as follows, page one, delete section two. This is the A43 amendment. To the A43 amendment, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. This uh, removes the repealer. I think the old law is perfectly fine. And as it's amended, this will serve as a wonderful vehicle to bring back a whole bunch of good policy. So thank you, Mr. President. To the A43 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the A43 amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The amendment is adopted. To Senate File 4165, as amended. Further discussion? Senator Latz. <laughs> Mr. President, would Senator Abler yield for a question? Sure. He's not certain, but it looks so. <laughs> Senator Abler will yield. Senator Latz. I just wanted to know if he would yield. Nothing further. <laughs> he, Senator Latz, he is a very yielding individual. Any very further good. serious discussion? <laughs> To Senate File 4165. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, the, sec the Secretary will give the bill's third reading. Senate File Number 4165, a bill for an act relating to human services. Third reading. <laughs> further discussion. Seeing none, the Secretary will take the roll on Senate File 4165 as amended.
Calling Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Call on Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Call Senator Jasinski to report additional votes under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Prentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Kunish votes aye. Kunish votes aye. Senator Prince. And Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Torres Ray votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and no nays, House File 41, I'm sorry, Senate File 4165, as amended, does pass as title agreed to. Members, next bill on agenda on the agenda today is Senate File 1391, number 13 on general orders. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, Senate File 1391 simply corrects an oversight that occurred in 2016 when we passed le legislation to regulate debt management and debt settlement providers. The oversight occurred when an exemption for enrolled, enrolled agents was not included in the bill. Enrolled agents are individuals or firms that represent citizens and businesses before the IRS on tax audits, collections, and appeals. They're regulated by the Department of Treasury. The bill defines enrolled agents and enrolled agent firms and adds them to the debt management and debt settlement statutes. While working on this legislation, we also discovered there was no definitions of CPAs in this section 332A, so this bill also cross-references the definitions of CPAs in 326A. I'd like to thank the CPAs, the State Bar Association, the Department of Commerce, and the Minnesota Legal Aid working together to reach a consensus on this legislation. Uh, it took a while to get everybody on the same sheet of music, but uh, this is consensus legislation, and I ask for your support. Further discussion and amendments to Senate File 1391. Seeing none, the Secretary will give Bill's third reading. Senate File Number 1391, a bill for an act relating to commerce. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill, or the Secretary will take the roll on Senate File 30, 1391.
Appellant Senator Friends to report members voting on Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Hoffman votes aye. Hoffman votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kunish votes aye. Kunish votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Torres Ray votes aye. Calling Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Rosen votes aye. Rosen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. <laughs> All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and no nays, Senate File 1391 does pass and is title agreed to. Next bill on the agenda today for special orders, Senate File 3202, number 38 on general order, Senator Dornick. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senate File 3202 is just a podiatrist license date modification. We are all aware of Minnesota, and especially rural Minnesota, is experiencing a doctor shortage. This is true for every area of medicine, including podiatry. We need more podiatrists in our state. Albert Lee is in particular need after losing our longtime beloved doctor. Back in the 80s, preceptorships were common for these doctors. Preceptorships are essential, essentially the same as residency. 
with similar operation and training before licensure. Perceptorship's requirements transition, transition to residency at some point. Minnesota chose the year 1986. As the cutoff point to recognize these preceptorships, unfortunately this date is uh, preventing some from practicing in our state. Iowa's cutoff date is 1993. So this bill simply changes the Minnesota date to 1990. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Discussion to Senate File 3202. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Dornick yield? He will yield, Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dornick, I can't say I've had any one contact me on the issue. I appreciate your work on it, but I think I did read that the regulating boards were neutral on this. Uh, do you know, given the shortage in providing service, why the licensing boards would have been neutral? Thank you. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Weger, for the question. Uh, yes, the Minnesota Board of Podiatry Medicine and the Minnesota Podiatry Medical Association are both neutral on this. The only thing they were concerned was if there was any amendments, and we promised them that there would be no amendments. So thank you for the question. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate File Number 3202, a bill for an act relating to health occupations. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will take the roll on Senate File 3202. On Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Hoffman votes aye. Hoffman votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Kunish votes aye. Kunish votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Torres Ray votes aye. On Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Coran votes aye. Coran votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Call 
All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 64 ayes and no nays, Senate File 3202 does pass and its title agreed to. Members, next bill on the agenda is Senate File 3503, number 52 on general orders, Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a bill that was uh, negotiated out by the Appraisal Institute and the Department of Commerce. It's uh, regarding real estate appraisal and it has three main issues. The first one is uh, minimum damage acquisition evaluations. Uh, acquisition of right-of-way, new right-of-way and or easements uh, can be handled through a minimum damage acquisition report. The unfortunate thing is that, that those reports uh, do not meet the qualifications uh, under the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. Uh, what this provision does, it allows duly licensed appraisers to pr uh, provide those type of reports without following uh, those particular uh, requirements. Uh, the second element there is that out of 55 states and territories, uh, the, uh, the, we have to meet the qualifications of the appraiser uh, standards uh, at the national level and um, before continuing education. And the um, state of Minnesota does not allow uh, reciprocity as, as far as those continuing education hours are concerned. This provision will allow the state to accept the hours that are uh, approved by some other state who has to follow the same rules that we follow. And the final provision is a customary and reasonable fee. In 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act set up a, uh, a fee schedule option that states could follow. However, it has caused to be more problems uh, and confusing for states uh, than it is helpful, and therefore we are eliminating the fee schedule option. And what this basically means is that all appraisal fees need to be negotiated between the uh, buyer of the appraisal and the appraiser and negotiated based on requirements uh, the complexity of the property, and uh, those type of things. Uh, those are the three provisions that are covered in this bill, and I would uh, ask for your support, and we'll stand for any questions. Discussion and amendments to Senate File 3503. Seeing no further discussion, this bill, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 3503, a bill for an act relating to commerce real estate appraisers. Third reading, final discussion. Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill, uh, we'll take the roll on Senate file 3503. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Hoffman votes aye. Hoffman votes aye. Call on Senator Jasinski to report members voting in a rule of 40.7. Senator Jasinski. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Abler votes aye. Abler votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Coran votes aye. Senator Coran is at his desk. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Senator Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and no nays, Senate File 3503 does pass its title agreed to. Next bill on the agenda, Senate File 3049, number 49, on special orders, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, this is a very straightforward bill that we brought through the committee process with no opposition. This is in regard to the federal home loan bank uh, system that we have uh, across the U.S., but this deals with some of the state law uh, clarifying uh, some of the rights and procedures within state law. It, it doesn't do a lot of substantive changes, only clarifies some of the issues that they were having in regards to uh, staying some of the uh, federal home loan bank's rights uh, after uh, a default. So that's the main uh, issue within this bill. Uh, I'm more than happy to stand for questions. Discussion and amendments to Senate File 3049. Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 3049, a bill for an act relating to commerce establishing, establishing certain rights for federal home loan banks. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the, the secretary will take the roll on Senate file 3049. Call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Friends. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Friends. And Senator Hoffman votes aye. Hoffman votes aye.
on Senator Jasinski to report members vote in rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll give this one more shot. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Tomasoni votes aye. Tomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Abler votes aye. Abler votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Senator Engelbertson votes aye. Engelbertson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weber votes aye. Weber votes aye. How Senator Jasinski vote? Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and no nays, Senate File 3049 does pass as title agreed to. Next bill on the agenda is Senate File 3850, number 57 on general order, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, if you came in to vote on that last one, I'd recommend that you don't leave because you're going to be voting uh, fairly soon here on this as well. Uh, this, again, is just another clarification. It went through committee without uh, any objection uh, in civil law committee. This deals with 604 uh, indemnity agreements for design professionals. Uh, what this does is, is really clarifies uh, the insurance coverage uh, issue that they're having in, in contract negotiation. Currently, there isn't. Uh, actually a uh, product offered out there. However, because of language within our statute right now, uh, there is some gray area where it makes it sound like you are going to be, uh, these design professionals will be liable, but if there isn't any uh, insurance coverage out there, uh, that becomes pretty confusing when it comes to negotiations. Now, make sure you keep this separate. This is just design professionals. This has nothing to do with uh, general contractors or subcontractors. That's another chapter of law, so I just want to make sure that folks are clear on that as well. Uh, so again, folks, I'd appreciate your support on this small, uh, small bill here helping out the design professionals. Thank you. Discussion to Senate File 3850. Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate File Number 3850, a bill for an act relating to civil law, indemnity application clarification. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill, Senate File 3850, it's, <laughs> take the roll. Call Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Tomasoni votes aye. Tomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Abler votes aye. Abler votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Dames 
Sanders votes aye. Haynes votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weber votes aye. Weber votes aye. Call Senator Frentz to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Frentz. And Senator Hoffman votes aye. Hoffman votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and no nays, Senate File 3850 does pass and it's titled Agreed To. Final bill today is Senate File 29, 2922, number 48 on general orders, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senate File 2922 is a simple bill that will allow debt collection professionals to continue to work from home as they have been doing the last two years. This provision was included in the 2021 Department of Commerce bill, but it sunsetted May 31st, 2021. Uh, the department is still supportive of it. Um, these employees do need the flexibility to be working from home, so this bill would uh, fix the quirk in the in the law that would allow this to take place. Thank you, Mr. President. I encourage your green vote. Discussion to Senate File 2922. Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate File number 2922, a bill for an act relating to commerce mod modifying provisions related to collection agencies. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will give Senate file 2922 his roll call vote. <laughs> Calling Senator Jasinski to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Anderson votes aye. Anderson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Gazelka votes aye. Gazelka votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Lang votes aye. Lang votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Newman votes aye. Newman votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Utke votes aye. Utke votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Abler votes aye. Abler votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Benson votes aye. Benson votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Dames votes aye. Dames votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Ingebrigtsen votes aye. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Weber votes aye. Weber votes aye. Call on Senator Frentz to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Eaton votes aye. Eaton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Klein votes aye. Klein votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Newton votes aye. Newton votes aye. Senator Frentz. Senator Putnam votes aye. Putnam votes aye. Senator Frentz. And Senator Hoffman votes aye. Senator Hoffman votes aye. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and no nays, House File 2922 does pass and its title agreed to. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we will move to the fifth order of business. Reports of committees. The secretary will read the report. Senator Nelson from the Committee on Taxes, to which was re was referred House File Number 3669, a bill for an act relating to taxation, reports the same back with a recommendation that the bill be amended as follows, delete everything after the enacting clause and insert, and when so amended, the bill do pass.
Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the committee report read by the secretary be adopted. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, motion does prevail. Moving to the seventh order of business, second reading of House bills. The secretary will read the House file number. House file number 3669. Second reading. Moving to the 13th order of business. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Murphy all day, Senator Limmer from 11 to 11.45, Senator Fateh, 12.50 to end of session, Senator Ingebrigtsen, 12.45 to 1 o'clock, Senator Abler from 1.05 to 1.20. Further announcements of Senate interest. Announcement, Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. One more reminder for tomorrow night, the I-90 party at CHS Stadium starting at 5 p.m. Further announcements. Senator Howe. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, members, I, I tell you what, when we, we, we fight, we argue when we're on the floor, but when uh, bad things happen to one of us, uh, we all hold together. And I tell you what, I just want to thank you, thank all the members for the kind words with the loss of my mother and the the acts of condolences, the, the words of sympathy have meant a lot. And uh, I just want to thank you. It was very comforting. It was a, it was a long month, uh, hard struggle, but uh, she's in a better place. And I just want to thank you for, for all the sympathy that you showed. Thank you. Any further announcements? Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. And before I make my final motion here, I do want to do one quick shout out to, I know, uh, across the nation, and we've got several uh, folks from our state here as well uh, that are participating down in Dallas, Texas at the VEX World Robotics Championship. And actually, my son is on one of those teams, so I just want to tell those folks, good luck. Go get them. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Wednesday, May 11th at 10.30 a.m. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The motion does prevail. The Senate is adjourned.